Welcome, welcome back to Boss and Cage Podcast. And I, I think this episode is is an episode that's pretty much overdue. And I, you know, a lot of times I talk about business, I talk about strategy, and one thing that we've you know talked about every once in a while, maybe like trademarks, but we really haven't really dove into patents. So today we have our patent boss, Carrie. So Carrie, why don't you give our audience a little uh, little details about who you are and, and, and kind of like a little bit of your backstory. Yeah, so thank you for having me. My name is Carrie Seacard. I'm owner of Virtual IP Law. I've been a patent attorney for a little over 10 years. My dad's also a patent attorney. He got me into it at a young age. Um, Worked for a few different firms, but the traditional law firm partnership wasn't really a good fit for me. So I started my own firm. It's been almost two years now, and we've grown to a team of seven patent attorneys and we're all over the United States uh, operating virtually. One of the good things that came out of the pandemic is, you know, a lot of people have realized the beauty of Zoom. So uh, it's really helped my business to flourish. So, I mean, you know, I would do my due diligence before I interview someone. And, and it seems like you were like raised to be where you are currently right now. Like it, it's not only ingrained in your DNA, but obviously you went to school and I think you, you got like some engineering background and you got a little technology. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, was that something that your dad kind of pushed you to or is that something that you just felt that you needed to do because you wanted to do it? A little bit of both. I really loved that he was always learning about new technology. And even back in the 90s, he was able to work from home, which was kind of unheard of back then. And he was just always learning about medical devices. And I had a love of engineering and math, um, which is a little unusual. (laughs) Most people, math isn't their favorite necessarily. So I naturally led into engineering. Patents have kind of exploded a little bit, but they're still not very, you know, there's not a lot of knowledge about there. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about, is it worth getting a patent? Is it not worth getting a patent? Things like that. Um, So it's really helpful having that engineering background to be able to talk to engineers about their ideas and things like that. And my dad said, well, if you're going to be any type of engineer, um, you know, electrical engineering is probably the way to go because, you know, computers and things like that are advancing so quickly. It's hard to believe it's been almost 20 years since I got my engineering degree. Um, So it's, it's been a little time, but things are just advancing so quickly. It's great having that foundation of engineer transitions well for patents. Wow. Wow. So, so let, yeah. let's back it up a little bit. And, and for the listener, right, you know, so they probably heard the word copyright. They probably heard the word trademark. They probably heard the word patent. And, you know, the reality is, is that there there's similarities, there's some overlap. But, you know, could you kind of define the differences between these three and, and when they should be applied? Yes, absolutely. So I love to use um, the simple example of John Deere tractor because they do have a lot of intellectual property. So the trademark would be on the name John Deere. They actually have a trademark on the color John Deere. You can, you naturally have trademark rights wherever you're using the mark. So a trademark internationally is, or I should say nationally through the federal registry is not for everyone if you're just operating in one state and you don't plan to have clients in multiple states may not be for you but if you're a big name like john deere you want to protect that name in all 50 states then it would be worth getting a trademark on your name Hmm. now the copyright would be maybe they have a brochure or the operating manual on the tractor itself any works of art that are related to that would be a copyright. Your copyright also exists. You have natural copyright when you create that work of art. But if you ever want to be able to sue someone for copying your work of art, then you would want to register it with the copyright office. Now, the patent, on the other hand, patents are different because they're there aren't natural rights that are tied to patents, the same as trademarks and copyrights. You have to file a patent to get your rights on it. 
and the patent would cover, let's say you come up with a new tractor or maybe a new software system, or maybe there's a cool John Deere app that allows you to look up tractors, something like that. So that would be patentable. Um, the most important thing with a patent is to make sure that you're protected before you disclose the idea, because if you disclose the idea, that can kind of have an impact on whether you can or cannot get a patent. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, let's just dive into patents a little bit more. And, and, and anyone that has ever listened to Shark Tank, they're probably familiar with the terminology utility patent, but that's just one type of patent. So let's just talk about like the variables of patents and, and, and how they protect you and, and when should you use them? Yes. So patents are most are best used for people who either want to make and sell the product themselves or if you're interested in licensing the technology behind your product. That's usually the most common uses and it can just be an asset. So I common, I often say I like to turn your ideas into valuable assets. A lot of companies spend a lot of time on research and development and they don't really actually turn that into the into that asset that they need for a patent. Very cool. Um, Very cool. So, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, obviously, like I said before, I mean, you were kind of raised into this I mean, you have the engineer mindset, but obviously with, with patents and being an attorney, you have to have some creative knowledge as well too. And you have to have the legal thing. So that there's multiple different things in your brain, left brain, right brain, always fighting and <laughs> competing. So like, let's talk about you as like a kid, like, you know, what kind of kid were you growing up? Well, that's a great question. Um, I was always, I loved uh, cars, anything mechanical, just trying to figure out how things worked, how they came apart, what, you know, what made an engine tick, what is the crankshaft, how does the gas make everything work. So I definitely always had a love of how, how things are put together and how do things work always questioning why and you know why do we do these why do we do things a certain way can we make it better that's the thing I love the most about patents is it's always it's either a new advancement or it's an improvement on an existing advancement and it's just it's really cool always learning about that um, and I'm not sure if I fully answered your question earlier about utility so there are different types of patents the utility covers you know, the usefulness of something. There are design patents that cover the appearance of it. And there are plant patents, which I don't even touch because that's more for someone with a biology background. I'm, my background is a little bit more of the hardcore electrical engineering software based. Um, those are very specialized. So I think it's very interesting. I mean, like, so <clears throat> when would you make a, like a referral or a recommendation for someone to, to, to get a patent? Are you talking about if somebody is creating a new app or are they taking, like you said, maybe a tractor and they're re-engineering it? Maybe they're changing it from gas to hydro or something new. Is that a good time to get a patent? Yes. And the, timing wise, you want to make sure you have that protection in place before you disclose it. That's the biggest thing. So we used to be a first to invent system, which was, I, I really loved the first to invent system. As an engineer, we had to keep lab notebooks and have them witnessed as to when you invented things. And we transitioned in 2013 to a first to file system. So now it's literally a race to the patent office. So if you disclose your idea, although the risk is relatively low, it's still risky that someone else could take your idea and either file their own patent on it, or even worse, they could improve it and file a patent on that improvement. And then it makes your ability to really, you know, commercialize and market the product not, not as viable. Um, sometimes there's just a lot of value in being patent pending. And that's why, you know, you brought up Shark, Shark Tank. They often ask, do you have a patent on file? Because, you know, they don't get into the details, but there are some risks if you're disclosing the idea without having a patent on file. And it, it just makes your idea a little bit more valuable, sometimes a lot more valuable. <laughs> So, I mean, just to talk about that, right? I mean, obviously you're saying about Shark Tank going on there and you're disclosing it to the world, saying that, right? Mm -hmm. There's no N NDAs in, th in that situation. So I want to talk about like your worst case analysis or scenario that you've ever been into to where somebody may have had an NDA in place and their patent wasn't even on filed yet. And then someone may have took their idea, even with the NDA being in place. Have you had that situation before? Uh, yes, there are, there are actually so many examples even down to the the right person didn't sign the nda um if you don't have the person that's 
in charge of the company signing your NDA, NDA it can actually make the whole NDA null and void. Wow. Um, and the bigger, so uh, breaking that down a little, like Shark Tank, for example, there are no NDAs in place. Oh. So they're, the only way to really protect yourself in that situation is to file a provisional. And literally, even if you just file it yourself, you can go to the patent office. There are some really good resources that you can use. Most attorneys will tell you that you have to have a patent attorney. Yes, it would be ideal, but not every startup can afford a patent attorney right out the gate. The very least, get that protection in place yourself. And then a year from then, you can follow up with a, with a patent attorney to get the non-provisional. Yeah, I'm loving this conversation because, you know, I've, I've had I've filed two trademarks, right? I have a trademark from my Cerebral 360 and a trademark for Boston Cage. And to what you say, right, I mean, you could file this information yourself, but there's always that caveat, that always that catch, especially with trademarks when you're filing for multiple classes, right? So let's say if I'm filing for class 40, 25, and 16, and 40 and 25 are great, but 16 is a hurdle. And it bounced, the entire trademark gets bounced back because of that one thing. And you can't just say, forget about 16 and move forward with 40 and 25. Is that the same kind of thing with patents? Yes, it is very much so. The one difference between trademarks and patents is patents have basically what's called a provisional application. It's kind of like a placeholder. It would be, there isn't really anything. And well, it's kind of like an intent to use application. So I'm not sure if in trademarks, you can file a use based, which means you're already using the mark, or you can file an intent to use mm -hmm. trademark, which means I'm intending to use it in commerce, but I'm not using it yet. Provisional is kind of similar in the patent space. Say I want to protect this idea, but I'm not really commercializing it yet. Mm -hmm. And then you have a year to convert that to what's called a non-provisional or sometimes a utility application that is examined. Um, you know, in the trademark space, both of those are examined, but in the patent space, the provisional is not. So that is something that is probably the only thing it's not perfect or it's not ideal to file yourself. But if there was one thing that you could do yourself, I would say file that provisional. The one the one thing I would caution, well, there, you know, there are a lot of cautions to that, but if, if worst case, you're going to disclose something, you want to have some protection in place, you can't have an NDA, file your own provisional, you have to convert within one year, that is not extendable. If you don't convert, you lose the rights to do so. And that gives you a year to try to come up with funding and find an attorney and, and all of those things. And you're patent pending during that time. So yeah, patent pending, it's, it's a, I think we hear it so much. It sounds sexy. Oh, patent pending. It's kind of like it, it's it a is. turn on for investors. for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, like diving into, I mean, obviously you, you raise into this. I mean, you have a partnership with your dad. So most people like, and I have a 16 year old son right now and he's a 16 year old teenager and he's going through that age group right now where no matter what I say, he doesn't want to hear it. Right. So. I'm sure you went through that with your dad as well. So when did that conversion happen to where you're on the same level with your dad, you guys are seeing somewhat eye to eye and you decide to partner with him? Yeah. Um, I think right from the get go, I kind of had to separate dad from Dave <laughs> at work and just kind of keep that separ separation of, okay, it's not dad telling me what to do. You know, it's Dave giving me, giving me work advice um, but we've, we've always kind of worked together in some capacity, but never, never to the extent that we are working together now, um, just different opportunities we've had or not had to work together. And when this opportunity came up to start this firm together, um, it was just, it was just the perfect timing and he has given me such good advice and been just an amazing mentor um, over my career. I've been very fortunate to have his guidance. So Very cool. Very cool. So being that your dad's been in the game so long, I would think that he has a lot of systems and a lot of detail oriented things that are already in place. So like, what does your onboarding process look like when someone comes to you and they're throwing up saying they have all these ideas and here's my schematics and my drawings and I have this wire board and all this craziness. And you're like, wait a minute, what's the next step? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, I always start with um, an initial consultation for no charge, minimum of 15 minutes. It usually runs to at least a, uh, 30 minutes just to get the lay of the land to start. Have you had any public disclosures? What are your plans for this patent? Are you going to be making this a product? Are you going to be licensing it? If you, your attorney should be asking you those types of questions before they're just diving in. Because if you're, you know, um, I often ask, is it going to be an offensive strategy, right? Are you going to be going after people that are copying you? Do you want to have a lot of patents in place to be able to do that? Or is it more of a defensive strategy where you just don't want anyone else to copy you? And, you know, maybe you'll send a couple of cease and desist letters, but you're really not going to be actively going after people. Um, and that really determined, that makes a big difference in what your patent application is going to look like. And that is one thing that I'm very fortunate of having the benefit of not only many years myself, but uh, many years of my dad's just guidance of asking these questions up front. You know, some clients literally, they, you know, they don't have the funds to you know, it's, it's expensive, but it's over time, right? The, the term of a patent is 20 years. So there's filing fees that are due, and then there's back and forth that happens over one to five years. And then there are maintenance fees due at eight, um, four, eight, and 12 years. It can be expensive, right? But for most going companies, it's well worth the protection. I mean, it comes back tenfold. I've seen patents sold for millions, sometimes even billions of dollars or licensed. That's passive income, you know, for, but some startups, they don't have that kind of money. And literally they just want to have that sexy patent pending for a couple of years. And so we literally will just file enough of a baseline to get them a patent on file, knowing that maybe this won't issue into a full patent down the road. Maybe this won't be something that they'll be able to enforce, or maybe, maybe it will just be a really, really narrow mm -hmm. patent, but at least in that interim, they'll, they'll be able to label things patent pending, which is very attractive to investors mm -hmm. and things like that. And sometimes just that in and of itself can be very valuable. So um, part of the driving factor behind me starting my firm was one of my frustrations with a lot of brick and mortar firms. And it's fine for larger companies. They kind of have to have a set fee and charge a set amount for every client. By being virtual and everyone working from home, we can be a little bit more flexible with our pricing so that, you know, some of our startup clients that maybe their technology is really simple, but they need a lot more handholding. We can have kind of a lower rate where we don't have a fixed fee, but then some of our larger clients, we have that, you know, more rigid pricing structure. And it's just, it's so nice having that flexibility of working with the smaller clients mm. so they don't have to, you know, they, they can have affordable services and they yeah. don't, not everyone needs a Cadillac patent. Some people just need a scooter patent, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. And I think, um, I think one of the key words that you reuse over and over again, since we've been talking and I think I want the listener to really hone in on this word is examine, right? And it's, it's, it's one of those words that you think from a doctor standpoint, they're going to examine you. But in reality, I mean, that's what you're doing with these particular patents or with these trademarks and comes to fruition. The other thing that you brought up was being offensive versus defensive. And I think most people don't realize like an offensive tactic is essentially a tactic that you can monetize, right? And I've known people that have went in, they have figured out gaming systems, they've created the game, filed for the patent, and they only did that just so they could sue other companies. And they sue companies enough to where they're millionaires because they're constantly keep suing people. And again, going back to your offensive tactic, but you know, it's the first time I'm actually hearing a lawyer actually say it say it yes. it's like it's, it's a real thing and it's, it's i would say like industry wise uh, as far as patents go like percentages how many people are more on the offensive versus defensive i'm not sure about that um it really comes down to the the client specific desires um i have you know i've worked with some clients that that's their strategy they want to have a lot of patents whether they are or are not not actually practicing the invention behind it and they just want to be able to enforce it. I have some clients that sort of from the same 
standpoint want to use it as a passive form of income through licensing instead. Um, it's actually pretty well known that Amazon, they're not very litigious. They're probably not going to sue you. However, if you sue them, be prepared <laughs> because yeah. there's a good chance they've got an arsenal of patents that you're probably infringing. And that's actually part of how they've grown so large is because they turn around and just cross license. So that's another huge advantage to patents that a lot of people aren't aware of is if you have your own patent, um, I like to use the analogy of a spider web, mm-hmm. let, let build up your own spider web because someone else has their own web of patents that you're probably going to get caught in. Mm-hmm. And so if you get caught in their web, you have your own patents so that you can kind of cross back and forth with. And then if someone gets caught in your web, you can kind of see, hey, what have they got in their web? Is there something that I want? Can I use this as leverage? Maybe they have this really cool feature that I want in my device. Can I use that as leverage? And if you don't have any patents to bring to the table with other big players that do have patents, sometimes you can be at a disadvantage. So there are a lot of other things you can do with a patent for sure. So, I mean, pretty much what you just described to me is like Sun Tzu's art of war in patents. That's what it sounds like. It sounds <laughs> like you, you take an advantage when you when you have to take advantage and you're getting your stance when you need to get your stance. And when someone's weaker, you get the upper hand. And I mean, that's, that's what you're describing. So it, it's, it's crazy that that's the way the patent game essentially is behind the scenes if you don't know. Yes, for sure. And we would have to schedule another session to even get started on the NFT blockchain and how that oh. impacts all of this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a interesting mind that, that, that you brought that up. So, I mean, like, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because I mean, the NFT space essentially, right? I mean, obviously, someone could use the likeness of something, and it could be like in the background; it doesn't have to be in the forefront. So, like, how would that work as far as creating patents with those NFTs? Then we're not sure yet, and okay. it's most of the applications haven't been examined yet, so we don't have a whole lot of feedback. They're kind of just out there waiting, but it's very interesting. I believe in 2020, something like only a few hundred blockchain related patents were filed. And I believe in 2021, it was in the thousands. So it's going to be very interesting. And like, how do you even claim that? I mean, a regular patent you have, you know, at the end you have your claims. So you'd say I have a chair with, you know, a seat and a back and four legs claiming in blockchain, it's really interesting. And you need to have use. Do you have use when it's an art? I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's really pretty interesting. Well, I think the, the point that you made earlier about being first to patent, right? And then with trademarks too, it's always the use. When did you use it as a website? So, I mean, having it on the blockchain, it's undisputable who used it first. Wouldn't that be correct in that, that situation? That's correct. And the interesting thing that's still being debated, but there are some um, case law coming down is, uh, is it use because it's not use in commerce because it's not the physical commerce. It's kind of a digital (laughs) version of that, if you would. But on the flip side, they're suing people who have the NFTs that are similar to federally registered trademarks. So if you can sue someone for for using a mark that's similar, that must qualify for use in commerce, it's a really interesting debate going on right now. I'm trying to absorb all the info that I can. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So let's talk about like 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 the, the expansion of your career, right? And I mean, we always hear about these overnight successes. Someone's hearing you. And I mean, you're spitting off so much jewels and nuggets right now of this information about trademarks and IP. Like, how long have you been on your journey to get to where you are currently? It's been a very long journey. Um, My dad literally started me in patents when I was five years old for Father Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. I don't know if that's still a thing, Um, but he was not one to give you crayons and a coloring book. I got a set of figures to draw, so he just got 